Hello, today we are recording part two of our webinar on psychosocial impact assessment. Part one was a live webinar that we recorded July 19th, 2017, and it was on the topic of understanding environmental impacts on vulnerable populations through psychosocial impact assessment. Fortunately, we were able to get through quite a few questions during the live 90-minute webinar, but we received a large number of questions that we didn't have time to answer. So uh, Michael and I decided that we should record a separate session to address them all. Some of the questions were similar that we received, so we streamlined and grouped them. So if you submitted a question as part of the original webinar, it may not be read exactly as you submitted it. My name is Bridget John and I work for the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA, which is hosting this webinar as part of a webinar series. You can find several of our past webinars, including the initial webinar on psychosocial impact assessment at iaia.org slash webinars dot php. We encourage you to listen to the initial webinar on this topic uh, that you'll find at that webpage if you haven't done so already. That will give you a bit of context for this Q&A session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce again our webinar presenter, and he'll be responding to the large number of questions we received from participants during the original webinar. Michael R. Edelstein, PhD, has been a professor of environmental psychology at Ramapo College in New Jersey, USA, since 1974. He's also been president of NGO Orange Environment since 1982. Michael has been doing psychosocial impact assessment since the 1970s, so he has lots of experience and expertise. So let's begin with our first question, Michael. What are the specific considerations to make when deciding if psychosocial impact assessment is warranted? Um, well, thank you, uh, Bridget. Uh, before I answer that question, let me just say that um, the large number of really good questions that came in was very exciting. And um, today we'll uh, do my best to try to uh, give a broad answer to as many as I can. Uh, but each of these questions really deserves uh, a big chunk of time that we, we can't give because they're great questions. So I'll, I'll do my best with them. Um, so um, in, in my view, uh, psychosocial impact assessment has a similar trigger to other questions of impact assessment, which is uh, the question, are there potentially significant adverse impacts? Uh, if there are, then uh, it's uh, warranted to assess them. Uh, maybe there aren't actually, in reality, uh, such severe impacts, and maybe there are, but the only way to find out is to do that assessment. So the question is, is there the potential for significant adverse impacts to occur? Uh, I talked about retrospective and anticipatory uh, assessment uh, in the presentation. Uh, that answer is for anticipatory assessment. Uh, with retrospective assessment, you can ask the question, uh, of whether uh, significant adverse impacts have occurred, and then you, you want to look at them. All right. Can you explain more about the regulatory, legal, or methodological arguments for inclusion of PSAA, psychosocial impact assessment? Well, I think each of those is a separate category. So if we look at the regulatory uh, requirements, um, there we see that uh, uh, they're different in every jurisdiction, but assuming impact assessment uh, is uh, required, I would argue that psychosocial impact assessment should be looked at uh, as one of the regular indicators of assessment uh, that we use, which includes social impact assessment in most cases, uh, and they also include uh, other types of assessment, biological, you know, ecological, uh, physical, uh, et cetera. So um, the, the real question with regulatory um, impact assessment has to do with whether or not uh, permits are issued and whether or not there are uh, 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 built into the permits requirements for certain types of performance and measurement over time and adjustment and uh, mitigation. And uh, so this is important uh, in that context to include PSIA uh, so that that can happen. Uh, in a legal context, of course, there's a question of uh, what jurisdiction you're talking about and what the laws are, uh, but uh, generally uh, what, what I call <clears throat> retrospective uh, PSIA is done in a legal context where 
a toxic tort is occurring uh, to address damages that have occurred because of some occurrence. Uh, so those could be uh, anticipatory legal actions, but they're often retrospective. And um, there, uh, 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 what psychosocial impact assessment does is it allows you to do a couple important issues. One is it, it allows you to talk about a causal link between uh, what has happened and what the impacts are, uh, and that's necessary in order to uh, to get um, a favorable uh, uh, legal decision. Uh, and it allows you to uh, really document in depth uh, what the consequences have been and to do it in a way that's flexible enough to uh, really bring out the impacts for a given group of uh, affected people in a given situation according to what the nature of that situation and those people are. So uh, it's a very flexible tool that works well in a legal uh, context. Uh, in terms of the methodological issues, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, that um, uh, there's a methodological argument for including PSIA because methodology is how you do it. Uh, but I think that the, uh, the key issue is depth. Uh, what I see in a lot of social impact assessments, uh, which skirt the whole area of psychosocial impact assessment, is really a lack of depth at looking at what happens to the people who may be impacted by a project. And uh, what uh, I think the, the real gift of psychosocial impact assessment is, is reaching in and uh, trying to really understand what those impacts are. So uh, the methodological reason for doing this is to really uh, get some depth so that you can tailor uh, mitigation or even decide not to uh, engage in a project, to permit a project because of its effects. Michael, is it better to do a psychosocial impact assessment at the project's design or at the implementation stage? Well, I think there's a third category besides design and implementation, and that's approval. Uh, if we're talking about anticipatory uh, uh, psychosocial impact assessment, we're really talking about the issue of approval. Uh, can the decision makers who are deciding whether or not a project should occur uh, be informed to the point where they understand the implications of that project and take that into account and whether to permit it uh, or how to permit the project? Uh, but as an environmental psychologist, uh, my early work, of course, was at the design stage, where one attempts to see that projects are designed to work for the people who will use them or be affected by them. And proper design, of course, can lead to uh, mitigation to begin with, uh, and uh, also can lead to decisions not to pursue projects where the impacts will be so adverse. Uh, so the design phase is a great phase to do it. Um, and uh, it is an anticipatory phase, but it's, uh, it's not the one that we normally think about in impact assessment, but it's certainly uh, valuable to think about. Uh, at the implementation stage, uh, it's also important to uh, think about these issues because when we um, implement a project, uh, what occurs may not be the same thing as what we anticipated when we did the anticipatory assessment. Something different may happen, and it may happen at point one, differently than it happens at point two, point three, or point four. So uh, monitoring over time with uh, some feedback loop into uh, reassessing whether the project should continue or be modified, uh, whether mitigation should occur, uh, whether various protections are needed that weren't anticipated, uh, this is a key issue. So I think that uh, the idea of including PSIA at implementation is also great. Uh, so I would uh, talk about those three contexts as being important. Can psychosocial impact assessment be done by a social impact assessment practitioner who is a social scientist not trained in psychology, or does it require the input of a psychologist for better rigor? Uh, well, I think uh, psychosocial impact assessment comes out of the interdisciplinary nature of the social sciences. Uh, I'm a psychologist as a social psychologist, but I could have actually been a sociologist and also called myself and been trained as a social psychologist. And many people think that what I do is anthropology or sociology. And I've done a lot of work with people in both fields, uh, as well as social workers and uh, uh, in other fields. I, I think that 
what we're talking about here is a, a, a body of practice and a methodology and, and an assessment of a certain type of phenomenon that uh, could be approached by any social scientist, not just a psychologist. Uh, I myself am not a clinician, so the real kind of uh, technical um, uh, questions that would arise from trying to make a diagnosis um, that would be consistent with uh, uh, professional practice and clinical psychology. It's not something I would undertake. And because I'm primarily a qualitative researcher, uh, I also uh, farm out uh, quantitative research when it's done to others. Uh, so you can bring in people, if you need something done in a rigorous way on a certain kind of measure, you can bring in a specialist for that measure. Uh, but f whether that measure is needed is the first question and a, a broad psychosocial impact assessment is useful for deciding what specific measures might lead to further understanding. If you get specific too early, uh, you're shooting in the dark and you might actually miss what's going on because you're looking for effects that uh, aren't particularly important in that situation. So, um, so the answer to the question is yes, I think this can be done by a broad uh, array of people. How do you mix social science approaches in impact assessment? Well, following up on uh, the prior point, um, one, as a social scientist, uh, has an array of methods. And uh, uh, the real question in any situation is, what's the best way to find out what's going on? And so I have my preference for the methods that I use, uh, but I do tailor every research situation to the peculiarities of the context and how one gets entry or access to it, uh, what's really appropriate. There are times uh, that uh, research is done entirely from an existing document record. Uh, there are times that uh, research is done face-to-face uh, -face, uh, in a qualitative way. Um, there are times that uh, uh, surveys are done. Uh, it really is a question of how one gets access in that situation. And uh, rather than uh, saying that there's only one method that can be used, um, I think that there are uh, many arrows that have to be in the quiver and you, uh, you use the ones that are appropriate to the situation. But I, I do strongly encourage qualitative approaches that really allow a narrative uh, uh, interaction with the people who are involved uh, to get their stories because um, uh, it's very possible in the social sciences to collect an enormous amount of data without really learning a whole lot about what the actual uh, impact is. And if we're looking at how people's daily lives and daily way of, their, their way of uh, thinking about their lives, uh, their emotional states are affected, uh, the most direct way to find out is to talk to them. Uh, so I, I really encourage that to be an element. Uh, but I think uh, there's a wide array of methods that can be put into play. Is PSIA standalone, or can it be integrated or appended to SIA? Uh, well, I mean, it, it arises as a type of social impact assessment, a subcategory. Uh, but there's no reason why it can't be standalone if a social impact assessment isn't being done. In much of the work that I've done, it is standalone. In fact, uh, only on a number of occasions have I worked as part of a social impact assessment, overall assessment. Uh, but I think it does ideally belong as part of an SIA. We've grouped the rest of the questions into different categories, theory, method, case studies, applications. So our next session, section, Michael, is on theory questions. Uh, how does human psychology change with environmental changes? And accordingly, what role does the environment play in this type of assessment? Well, the whole idea for psychosocial impact assessment arises from a recognition that environment is extraordinarily important for our psychological lives, uh, for our so psychosocial well-being, and that uh, uh, when we, in fact, degrade environmental conditions or change them dramatically, uh, this is uh, the context within which people are living. It has a major impact on, on those people. Uh, so uh, the reason why we do this assessment is that recognition. The reason why um, this assessment doesn't necessarily arise from psychology proper is that psychology as a field has been pretty much a contextual. And that's uh, not entirely true, but it's more true than not. 
And uh, so uh, we're really talking about a, a new type of um, uh, psychology. Uh, and in the 1970s, that was labeled environmental psychology. There are other terms of art that have come forward. But the point here is where we're really looking at context. And the reason we're doing that uh, is because uh, people are affected by context. I was just affected by a big truck sitting outside of my, my window. Um, you, you don't ignore environmental conditions. They, they affect you in, uh, in a direct way. So that's really the, the point of doing this assessment, and it's really the, uh, uh, the, the theoretical uh, uh, component of our view of psychology. A great real-time example right there. Uh, how do you account for life changes and psychological distress that occur with or without development projects? Um, well, um, the uh, uh, psychological and psychosocial impacts and effects are occurring all the time for people. In the course of our normal lives, we undergo many stressful events. We make many adjustments. Uh, we accommodate many situations. Uh, we're uh, stressed or not stressed. We cope well with stress. We don't cope well with stress. We have lots of resources to deal with stress. We don't have many. Uh, this is life. And so um, uh, when uh, turbulence, as I referred to it, occurs, when there's a, uh, an environmental impact, um, that turbulence doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs uh, with a population that has a certain amount of resources that they can use to cope with the situation. Uh, and sometimes people have a lot of resources, but they're not useful <laughs> for coping with that particular situation. So uh, coping resources may not be helpful. Uh, but uh, people are never caught with a tabula rasa. They're, they're caught in the context of their own lives. So um, that just makes it all the more uh, interesting as uh, an area of study, but also more complex for the people who are caught in situations. So for example, if you discover that your home uh, is uh, contaminated, uh, that's never obviously good news. It raises all kinds of issues. Uh, but if you already have an extreme concern over health issues, uh, and there are already health issues evident, uh, that obviously becomes a relevant piece of information that gets connected to the other. Uh, if people's relationships in a, in a couple are uh, disintegrating and they're having a great deal of difficulty, adding a crisis uh, to that situation doesn't necessarily help. Uh, so um, if people are um, well-employed versus not well-employed, if they uh, are uh, well-nourished and not well-nourished, the list can go on. Uh, we're always adding into that situation. So part of the art of doing psychosocial impact assessment is to actually assess how well people were coping with their lives before the turbulence and how the turbulence has affected how they cope and uh, uh, what the stress has uh, uh, meant for them, how it's impacted them. Uh, so uh, this is really what it's about. So, Michael, how much does your approach differ when working with people from other cultures? Do you find the Western-centric models are still applicable? Um, well, the approach itself is, I think, reasonably culture-neutral. Uh, but the uh, things that you find with regard to uh, the issues are not. And that gets to be very interesting. And I. I can't say that I've explored this um, to the fullest degree possible. I'm interested in always exploring it more. Uh, but the meaning of environmental change, for example, uh, has a very different significance to people who are land-based. It has an even greater significance to people whose uh, uh, beliefs uh, of, the, uh, of the order of the world are very much based in their local environment and the, the, the clues that they, they get from it. Uh, and uh, uh, it's different for people whose lives are such that they don't even notice what's going on in the environment around them one way or the other until it literally knocks on their door and they have to deal with it. So, um, you know, environment is certainly culturally influenced. Uh, health as well. And in the United States, uh, as uh, Neil Weinstein a long time ago uh, concluded, uh, we have a basic assumption that our health is uh, is good until proven otherwise. 
Uh, so that's kind of a core assumption that uh, that resides. Uh, that's not true everywhere. People uh, in some places tend to assume that health is not to be taken for granted, that it's, uh, that it's never uh, uh, good. Um, likewise, uh, the issue of control. I've spent a lot of time working in the, uh, the former Soviet Union, and uh, control is a very interesting issue. Uh, we tend in the West to have uh, a fundamental assumption that we have a high degree of control over our lives, and in fact, it's probably the pillar of Western psychology. And that assumption of control isn't necessarily shared and when I worked uh, in the former Soviet uh, region, I found uh, that there wasn't that degree of presumption of control. Uh, likewise, social trust varies uh, dramatically, or the, the way that the home is used and, and its role can vary from Okay, moving on to method questions. Does general opposition to big development projects make it difficult to get true measures of stress, anxiety, or depression related to a proposed action? Would it not be better to reserve such measures for post-project assessment or after a disaster? Um, well, taking the question at the end first, uh, the answer is no, it would not be better. Uh, a big project may, in fact, be an indication of big turbulence, and it may have a, uh, an unsettling uh, effect on many people just by its very nature. Uh, we need to understand what that effect is and whether it can be mitigated and whether it's acceptable. Um, just because it's a big project doesn't mean it's a good project or an acceptable project, a project that should be permitted. Uh, one needs to understand the impacts of that project and the fact that we've already learned that it's big tells us that it has an all-encompassing or, or very uh, large footprint and uh, so um, we need to know what that is. Uh, the fact that people may be responding to it because of its scale, not because of other factors, uh, may be part of what's going on and we need to tease that out, but that's not necessarily something to be ignored. Uh, scale is one of the major uh, environmental impact issues. Uh, so if we uh, choose to operate at a large scale, we generate uh, concerns that go with large scale projects and uh, those need to be understood. So I don't understand why you would put it off until, uh, uh, until the post uh, uh, construction. At that point, uh, it's a fait accompli and what do you do about it? Uh, you may want to monitor and do long-term uh, assessment of what the consequences are over time if the project occurs. I think that's good, uh, but clearly I would argue you should assess it from the, the get-go. In terms of waiting until a disaster occurs, uh, the whole issue is that uh, if a disaster occurs, you want to take a look at what the impacts were, but if you have a choice of averting a disaster by understanding uh, what's going on, uh, you should by all means uh, undertake that. Uh, and I can give some concrete examples of that. I don't want to burn a lot of time, uh, but in the Canadian work I did in Alberta, I got very much into uh, what the validity is of uh, the um, emergency response planning process. And I did an uh, interesting study uh, with regard to a tar sands upgrader in Fort Saskatchewan that was proposed. Uh, and uh, what I discovered uh, was that the uh, all the corporations use virtually the same emergency response uh, plan. So I was able to look at how well the emergency response plans work for the existing industries in um, uh, the industrial park that was there uh, and try and uh, make that as a, a basis of judging how well the proposed emergency response plan would work uh, for the proposed uh, it was a tar sand upgrader. And what I discovered was that the emergency response plans didn't work very well at all. But that was the normal way of doing things. It was always done the same way, the same language. It was always presumed. And that's a way of, uh, with pretty large scale projects, uh, pushing off the, the question of what the impacts are. When you start really looking at it, you realize that uh, uh, there are problems there and, and that you need to go back and really look at issues like does shelter in place work? Is evacuation really possible? Uh, is it possible to really communicate with people to let them know that a hazard is occurring in, in progress? Uh, if you can't do those things, you can't protect them. Uh, and 
uh, to address that after the fact when a disaster occurs is not the time to address it. We don't do a good job, as I've learned, in addressing it up front. Uh, we skate that issue. So in effect, we're doing what the questioner said, which is we're not, we're not doing the psychosocial impact assessment up front. Uh, we're uh, putting it off, and that's the wrong thing to do. Moving from that example to another question about examples, can you provide an example of how to eliminate bias in the careful selection of samples? Well, um, I tend to choose, because in my work I focus on people who are the most impacted, I tend to choose samples that are highly impacted. If you're working in a legal context, the samples, or at least the populations are chosen for you, they're the people who are litigating. Uh, if you're working uh, for an intervener in an administrative hearing, uh, who has intervened? Uh, people who are highly concerned. Um, if you're doing a study for other reasons, I tend to focus on trying to identify who's highly impacted. Uh, so that is a biasing sampling procedure, but it's done deliberately because uh, it's important to know who has the, uh, the, the, the most extreme impacts, uh, if you can. Uh, because those are the ones that most need to be uh, taken into account in decision making and uh, mitigated. Um, having said that, uh, once you've identified a population and you're sampling within it, uh, if you're not able to uh, uh, interview or gain measures from all of the people in the population, which sometimes you can, uh, but if you have to do a sampling within it, I, I prefer doing random sampling or some type of sampling that's as close to random as possible uh, to take out uh, some uh, selection bias uh, and get uh, some idea of representation. Uh, and I'll choose uh, sampling uh, factors uh, like location or uh, um, uh, let's say that you're uh, trying to tease out whether working for a given employer is a variable you would, might take into account people who do work for that employer and people who don't. It really depends what you're trying to do, but you, you try and choose uh, maybe balancing samples uh, that will give you different answers and uh, maybe contrast with each other. Sometimes when I do group, group interviews, I take people who are dramatically different from each other and I put them in one room and let them really try and explain to each other their differences or, or argue about it. Uh, try and see the actual dynamic that's occurring in a community. So the issue of bias uh, is a concern if it leads you to make wrong conclusions as a social scientist. Uh, but uh, from the standpoint of uh, choosing people who have a particular interest in the outcome, who are particularly impacted by an outcome, uh, bias in that sense can be actually an advantage in this type of work. The ne another question was asked by a participant who said, in the jur jurisdictions where I typically work, there seems to be a bias against impact information that is, quote, subjective versus something that can be measured physically. How do you suggest overcoming this? Well, I've certainly confronted that uh, in my entire career at various points. Uh, people like to see hard data uh, as though hard data automatically means something. And... Um, uh, so uh, the issue of subjectivity has been uh, uh, an issue in uh, legal and regulatory contexts. Interestingly enough, in the social sciences, it's become uh, highly legitimated. Qualitative research is right up there with quantitative research and what's taught in uh, research methods in all of the social sciences. And uh, so it's really come to be accepted very heavily. So the idea that you're actually going toward someone's subjectivity using a methodology that uh, captures uh, their subjective thoughts has gained uh, extreme legitimacy. Uh, the notion of a narrative approach that uh, has people, helps people tell their story is highly accepted. Uh, these are approaches I, I've used since the beginning of my career. They were not accepted at the beginning. And in some contexts, they're still not accepted. People want to have uh, hard evidence. Uh, I think the way to overcome it um, is to keep keep pushing it. Uh, what I did when I wrote my book, Contaminated Communities, is I went out and I did a complete uh, uh, survey of the literature that was available at that point in time, and I showed the convergence of that literature around consistent findings. And if you can look for points of convergence, 
it's always helpful. Sometimes when I'm doing uh, my qualitative research, I will include uh, uh, colleagues who do quantitative research uh, using variables that are uh, often studied using methods that uh, have been heavily validated. Uh, and we look for convergence between the findings between those two approaches. Uh, or you can use other um, uh, points for convergence, uh, what's also called triangulation. Uh, so you can uh, do the best you can to show the validity. Uh, I like to point to what I call uh, 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 logical validity as opposed to statistical validity, uh, which is that if all of the facts associated with a uh, project, including uh, what you've learned from a variety of interviews with different people with different points of view and different degrees of impact, if they all fit together into a complete narrative pretty well, then you know you have logical uh, validity. Uh, again, it's an issue of convergence. Where things diverge, you need to understand them and explain them. Uh, that's true of all the social sciences. And so I think a, a, a consistent method that is rigorous, uh, brought to bear, uh, looking for convergence, uh, looking for as many points of triangulation as possible, uh, and repeat it again and again. If you don't get discouraged, keep going back and going back, as I've done over my 40 years of working in this area. And uh, you have successes at that point. Uh, sometimes you have failures as well. So what methodology do you use to project the future scenario if you rely mostly on qualitative data? Well, qualitative data can be used to project the future just as well as quantitative data. Uh, yes, you're not using uh, statistical models uh, to uh, do that, uh, but modeling is only one way of uh, projecting the future. Uh, you know, looking at uh, scenarios and projecting them has been a, a technique that's been used uh, historically uh, longer even than using uh, uh, modeling. Um, the real issue with projecting the future is that if you can identify the consequences that are occurring, they're, they're dynamic consequences, they're changes in people's behavior, how they feel about themselves, uh, how they're coping with the situation. <clears throat> you can uh, project those uh, according to uh, potential future outcomes for whatever condition is being studied. So if it's a, uh, if it's a factory, uh, you can look at worst case scenarios or uh, scenarios that are considered to be much more likely and ask the question of how would people respond to these, how would they be impacted, how would their homes be impacted, how would their views of their health be impacted, etc. Uh, and you can project that into the future quite well. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of validity to that. Now, some can always point out that there's always uncertainty, there's always things that can happen that you don't anticipate. The people may have avenues of recovery that you uh, you never anticipated. And in my work, I've seen some amazing uh, avenues of unanticipated recovery. Uh, but um, uh, th that's all true. Uh, you're not necessarily making projections necessarily for a given person, and you're never making projections that you think are 100% uh, exactly what's going to happen. You're talking about what are likely potential significant adverse impacts that could occur. And uh, that's something that you can project from qualitative work quite easily. In fact, because you understand the dynamics of a community, the dynamics of the uh, environmental hazard, uh, and the dynamics of the at least the individuals that you've talked to in the community uh, pretty well, uh, you can uh, really come up with some uh, pretty dead-on uh, estimates of what might occur. Uh, I'll just give you a very quick example. Uh, I did an environmental justice uh, study as part of the hearings over whether the Indian Point nuclear power plant plants should be um, uh, given new permits outside of New York City. Uh, subsequently, they, they are not going to be uh, continued, but, uh, but at that point there was a hearing before uh, the Atomic uh, 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 Safety and Licensing Board of the a Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and I ended up doing a study of Sing Sing Prison uh, to look at what the impacts in Sing Sing Prison would be if there was a, a major accident at Indian Point. Fascinating opportunity uh, to do research and to piece together a way of answering a question. When we actually got 
uh, I, I wrote an extensive uh, testimony and I, I presented testimony before the board and then they got into questioning and what they were uh, the judges were particularly interested in was one particular aspect of the testimony which is what would happen in terms of the social order inside the prison if in fact you were able to uh, if in fact you had a major accident um, if you're taking into account all of the various issues of sheltering in place uh, during a nuclear accident and the, the characteristics of the prisoners and the characteristics of the prison system what was likely to happen there and relying on uh, what happened at, uh, during the Katrina disaster uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the local prison in New Orleans uh, the uh, Orleans Parish Prison a penitentiary uh, it was possible to really talk about uh, a failure of social order inside uh, the Sing Sing prison that would be catastrophic and um, uh, my uh, clients had a uh, an ex-prisoner present who testified after I gave testimony who agreed with me uh, but this had a, a major impact on on the judges and it should have because we were able to project I was able to project based on what I did uh, uh, what would actually happen in a dynamic situation you could never do that with a computer model this is something that only qualitative assessment techniques could get at given your focus on assessing after a turbulence has occurred how do you do an anticipatory assessment including mitigation and management measures well I think I uh, just using the example I just gave um, uh, no disaster has happened uh, at Indian Point and hopefully none will happen before the plants are uh, decommissioned uh, but if it did happen uh, one can get a pretty good picture uh, of the uh, uh, impacts inside uh, Sing Sing prison uh, but as an extension of that uh, the judges had decided that the emergency response plan for Indian Point was not a matter for testimony in the hearings uh, but because of the nature of the testimony I was given I had actually uh, an opportunity to talk about um, emergency response planning in great depth and what would happen if you had to evacuate or more likely with the prisoners had to shelter them in place what would the consequences be um, and um, based on the work that I did and, and the other uh, situations that I looked at uh, including that case I mentioned earlier uh, with the tar sands upgrader in Alberta it was very clear to me that uh, the whole emergency response plan uh, was based on a series of assumptions that had not been tested and that were likely to not work out as anticipated and uh, uh, so that's an example I, I think you can uh, uh, really get into making very sophisticated uh, anticipatory projections that have a, a lot of credibility and uh, that actually can be explained in a way that makes a lot of sense and that uh, is acceptable in this case to uh, to the judges who by the way found uh, in favor of the uh, contention that uh, that I testified on on behalf of so uh, uh, I think that answers the question once you've reconstructed a baseline and assessed the current frame and projected a future frame Michael how do you identify the best mitigations to address the main impacts you've identified uh, well let's um, let's stay with this emergency response planning example to answer the question uh, what I learned in Canada which is the first time I ever paid attention to this issue specifically and and the reason for that was that when I was asked to be an expert witness uh, before the Energy Resource Conservation Board um, it was to just testify on this narrow issue of um, emergency response planning I was not an emergency response planning expert uh, they had actually hired an emergency response planning expert who looked at the plan and said it looks fine to me it looks like all the other plans no problem and the interveners who were people living around the proposed facility uh, said well wait a minute we, we, we need someone who can take a deeper look at this and they brought me in uh, the judges were not happy about this but uh, but I did take a deeper look and uh, let's take the issue of communication uh, an emergency response plan for a potentially hazardous facility whether it's a nuclear power plant or whether it's a factory or whatever uh, if you're assuming that if there's a release of something hazardous uh, 
that it will not harm people living in the area, then there has to be a way to prevent that harm. You've already now pre prevented the release, which is the primary way uh, to prevent the harm. Uh, but the release should be detected automatically, and they have SCADA, which is this automatic detection system. But in reality, what I learned was oftentimes releases were discovered because people saw them or they smelled them and they called them in and then the company discovered that there was a release. Um, that's not how it's supposed to work. You've already had human exposure at that point. Uh, when they, They're supposed to call people up and warn them if they have to take shelter. Uh, but if people are outside, they, they can't be warned. They, they may not have a cell phone with them or they may be out of range. Uh, or they may not hear it ring. Uh, so uh, there are a whole variety of ways that in fact occur where people don't get warned. There's no communication. People call in for information, but the people who answer the phone don't know. Uh, there's major delays, when in fact delay is the last thing you want, et cetera, et cetera. You go to shelter and house, but if you shut all the windows, is the air conditioning running and pulling air in, uh, et cetera. So uh, are the children home? Uh, alone and there's no parent or there's just a, uh, a babysitter or there's elders who can't shut the windows easily. So there's a whole variety of variables there. If you can't solve those variables, then you don't have an emergency response plan that works. This is the fact. So uh, the mitigation issue comes from uh, uh, the regulators saying to the company that's seeking a permit, well, we'll consider permitting you, but you've got to figure out a way to solve these problems. If you can solve them in a way that works, we'll give you a permit. If you can't, we won't. Uh, and that's really how the, the process is supposed to work. And uh, we just need to provide the information so that it can occur. So the answer to the question is, is that if you do a, a psychosocial impact assessment, if you discover what the issues are, then you discover what the mitigation needs to be. If people have been exposed potentially to hazardous uh, uh, chemicals, uh, maybe health monitoring and some kind of uh, assistance if there's illness uh, needs to occur or some type of testing needs to occur. Uh, if uh, their homes are no longer habitable for a variety of reasons, there needs to be a, 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 a way of allowing them to move that uh, uh, doesn't cheat them uh, and uh, uh, you know gets them out of a mortgage that may be tying them to a place that they don't feel comfortable living anymore, um, et cetera. There, there have to be ways of doing this. In order to know what those ways are, which are the mitigations, we need information. And the psychosocial impact assessment is a way to get that information. Michael, how do you identify vulnerable people? Well, uh, in the studies I do, sometimes they're self-identified. They've brought a lawsuit, they've intervened into an administrative hearing doesn't mean that they're the only people who are vulnerable or even the most, but usually they are. Um, and uh, so they're self-identified. If you're starting from scratch to identify who's vulnerable, you can look at the project that's being proposed or the disaster that's already occurred and look at where uh, various types of effects have occurred that would produce psychosocial impact assessments. Those could be physical effects in the sense of what the plume looked like, um, uh, the, uh, the release from uh, uh, an accidental release from a, a gas plant or a, um, you know, a factory of some kind or a, a nuclear plant. And you can follow the plume and look at who might actually have been physically impacted. The psychosocial impacts uh, it may not be so simple and that lots of people are impacted even if they didn't come in physical contact with a hazard. First of all, they may not know if they came in physical contact with a hazard, and no one may know, and that's one issue. Uh, but there, uh, if you have, for example, uh, I'm thinking of my uh, early days when Three Mile Island occurred, a nuclear accident in Pennsylvania, and the governor eventually, after uh, uh, some delay, ordered uh, uh, pregnant women uh, and children, no, I have to remember, I think it was under five, to be evacuated. Anytime you create boundaries, you create problems. Uh, and this also occurs with physical boundaries. You're going to evacuate people who live here but not here. 
uh, or you're going to assume that people were impacted who live here but not here. Uh, when you create a boundary, uh, then you create margins, and margins are always a problem. So the, the pregnant women and uh, or with children under five, they, they knew they had to leave. Um, they may have left or not, but many of them did. Uh, but then you had, uh, what if your child was uh, just turned six last week? Uh, or what if your child was six and you were still worried about their health? Why, why would a five-year-old be at risk when a six-year-old was safe to stay? Uh, those are the kind of boundary issues uh, that get created. And if it wasn't safe for uh, children to stay or pregnant women, would it really be safe for anybody to stay? Uh, and uh, uh, you can look at this in the current case of the Fukushima uh, Daiichi disaster that's still ongoing in Japan. Uh, anytime you create boundaries you cr and you create margins, and those margins are hard to defend in many cases. I've done a lot of work at Love Canal, which was the, the signal event in the United States for a contaminated community, and I had a chance to go back and uh, do some research recently on an area of Love Canal which has a new contamination problem and to look at the situation again. And Love Canal is so interesting because they drew these boundaries under duress. Uh, the boundaries of who was at risk and who was not, who would get government assistance to move and who would not, created enormous social upheaval as people demonstrated to be included in the boundaries so they could leave. Uh, eventually, some people got to leave and some people didn't. Uh, then they did a, a habitability study included that some of the houses they had evacuated were actually safe. Some of the places that uh, they hadn't evacuated actually were dangerous. They moved more people out. They sold some houses that they had evacuated people from. Uh, now the question is whether some of the people who move back in are uh, exposed to hazards. So um, these boundaries are always a problem. They're just a problem. Um, so I lost the question. What was the question? <laughs> How do you identify vulnerable people? Ah, yes. <laughs> So um, uh, the question is uh, to, to actually look at the situation carefully and try and identify where there were physical exposures, but also where there were exposures to turbulence. And that turbulence doesn't have to be a physical exposure. It can be that all the social uh, 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 changes that are put in place to ad address the physical uh, release, the physical turbulence. So there's social turbulence that always goes along with Physical turbulence and the social turbulence causes at least as much stress as the physical turbulence does. And so you got to really look at, at uh, who is uh, caught up in that, and uh, that's how I would do it. Uh, let me also note that there were researchers in the early uh, part of the field who uh, liked to do controlled community uh, studies, and they had some success showing significant differences on various variables between areas that were. Um, uh, potentially contaminated in areas that weren't, uh, but they couldn't really understand what the dynamics were that went in uh, to that. Um, it, the art is really trying to figure out where where the turbulence occurred, and that's where you're going to find the impact. On another question related to vulnerability, can you address the selection and development of social vulnerability indicators? Um, well, I mean, there's a variety of indicators in the social sciences for social vulnerability, and I don't particularly use them, so I, I don't want to get into a long discussion of them, but you certainly can look for uh, uh, correlations between indications of social vulnerability and environmental uh, consequences. The one I will talk about in the United States is um, the field of environmental justice that grew up after uh, President Clinton's executive order on environmental justice. And it attempts to identify uh, vulnerability uh, on two criteria. One is, uh, is there a community that would be classified as a potential environmental justice community uh, that is a vulnerable community? And that would be a community that uh, has uh, 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 triggers, and there are some variations of this I won't go into, but it triggers a sufficient uh, percentage of the population that are minority uh, or that are uh, impoverished. Uh, but in more recent thinking, um, you could have uh, elders, you could have uh, young people, uh, you could have disabled people, you could have people who for some other reason uh, 
have no control over their lives or no say in the situation. And those can be considered to be vulnerable people. The second uh, part of it is, was there a disproportionate uh, impact? And tying back into the prior question, you're looking for where there is potential disproportionate impact. If you have disproportionate impact in a, and a vulnerable population, it would be, in this sense, an environmental justice situation. Uh, I would argue that you can have disproportionate impact for people who are not a vulnerable population per se, uh, and it's still an adverse impact. Uh, and on the other side of the coin, I've worked in many situations where you had environmental justice populations, but they weren't in sufficient numbers to trigger being considered an environmental justice population. But the dynamics of the situation certainly uh, followed uh, the vulnerability of a particular uh, population. Uh, and in those situations, uh, you, you clearly have to look at those variables, whether you can uh, come up with a demographic trigger or not. Very quick example, uh, I had a chance to work on what's called the American uh, Bhopal incident. Uh, Texas City, Texas, uh, a hydrofluoric uh, gas release uh, from a factory goes out over the community. People are literally running away from the gas. Uh, fortunately, uh, unlike in Bhopal, India, with the methyl isocyanate, this gas in Texas was not uh, fatal on ingestion, but it did cause respiratory problems. Uh, but you had this amazing, horrible situation. Uh, the people who lived right up against the factory, uh, there were uh, 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 housing projects for people of low income. They were right up against the factory wall, reminiscent of, uh, of what happened in Bhopal, different, of course, in detail. And uh, they also were the people who were least likely to have cars. So they were the people who were running down the street, who were trying to shelter when, in fact, sheltering didn't protect them from the gas. Uh, so, um, in that situation, you clearly have uh, uh, a disproportionate impact, and you also have vulnerable populations, uh, but if you use the, uh, the methods that are used to quantify environmental justice, you would not reach the trigger, probably, um, but you clearly had an environmental justice situation because the population that was most vulnerable to that uh, situation were the people who had the uh, who were minority, uh, who were poor, and who lived in, in those housing projects, and uh, they also were people without uh, transportation. Uh, ironically, uh, not ironically, but not surprisingly, uh, the people who lived furthest away from the release were the people who owned the factories, or were the managers of the factories. Uh, so you have uh, normal social dynamics occurring there. We have to pay attention to those things because they often correlate to vulnerability and uh, uh, very directly. One of our webinar participants asked how can he develop PSIA tools to incorporate into environmental health studies? Well, I like that question because there's a very fine line between psychosocial impact assessment and environmental health questions. Um, I would argue as a psychologist that psychological uh, well-being is an indication of health, and uh, there's a very fine line between what constitutes uh, other measures of health and psychological health, and psychosocial health by extension. So I think health studies should include psychosocial measures, um, and I have a study that we've done in uh, Uzbekistan uh, with a contaminated community where uh, we did uh, put psychosocial uh, measures into a health study. Uh, so we could uh, collect everything at one time. Uh, so uh, it's the right thing to do, uh, and uh, um, I think psychosocial impacts affect health. Uh, the other side of the coin is that when people become ill, um, that there are psychosocial impacts clearly that go along with that. Uh, whether the illness is due to the turbulence is always the, the, the question at hand. Uh, but if there's turbulence and people are ill for other reasons, it's still a variable that affects their ability to cope with the situation. So any way you look at it, I think it belongs there. Uh, let me just add one other thing, which is in many situations, I talked about boundaries, but one of the interesting boundary situations that you find has to do with the setting of standards or guidances, which are numbers uh, for exposure that are not 
measured as standards. They're, they're not uh, developed sufficiently to be standards. They don't have the weight of the standard. But there are many situations, for example, in the United States or comparing the United States to uh, World Health Organization, where there are different numbers associated with how much exposure can occur to different contaminants. Uh, so what constitutes too much exposure? Well, if you are in a municipality that has a, a high threshold, um, so it tolerates a higher exposure, but you're aware because everybody looks at the internet or is networked into uh, experts, um, you're aware that other uh, jurisdictions uh, tolerate less exposure. That's a boundary that becomes very disturbing. And so you often have environmental health people who are caught up in situations where they're trying to deal with, uh, trying to rationalize the situation where they're saying it's safe to continue living here, or it's not safe, or here's what you need to do to, to protect yourself, uh, when the numbers, even when they're standards, are actually somewhat fuzzy and hard to, uh, to defend. And so they're dealing with psychosocial issues, uh, even though they're, they're uh, environmental health scientists. Uh, just one more uh, example of that uh, uh, might be uh, interesting as well is that when you, uh, uh, I, I spoke about this actually during my, uh, my webinar, uh, it's a situation I, I made a particular reference to, but it happens very often, where you, you will do a test to see how much of a contaminant is in people's bodies. Uh, and um, so you now have results. And you have what I call a mitigatory gap, which is you now can tell people, yes, you have a high exposure. The example I was giving was with a, a new contaminant called a PFOS. It's PFOA and PFOS. And they're new contaminants. Uh, we had never paid attention to them before, but now we're paying attention to them. We can tell people they have too much in them. Then what do you do? Um, now people are living with knowing that they have too much in them. Uh, some people may be uh, reassured, and other people are set on a perpetual trajectory of lifescape uh, worry uh, and uh, expectation uh, about uh, adverse health outcomes. Uh, you've created a psychosocial situation by virtue of how you've managed your environmental health situation. Uh, I don't know what the right answer to how to handle that is necessarily, uh, but it's a can of worms, and you need to know how to uh, that that's going to happen and think in advance how you're going to deal with it because it'll happen and then if you haven't thought about it, you're now dealing with a situation without any preparation. Michael, one of the very common questions we received was whether you could provide some guidelines or a handbook on psychosocial impact assessment. Uh, well, I can't provide it right at this moment. Um, I, I think the interest in this webinar was such that I might actually try and prepare some materials. Uh, so let's just say that that's now uh, on my work list. I don't know that I'll get to it tomorrow. Uh, but I think it would be helpful to have some. And uh, so uh, I'm sure there are other people who would be interested in that as well. And it could be a collaboration. But, uh, but I would like to, uh, to work to, uh, to make it easy for people to do this work because I think it, it needs to be done. Great. Something to look forward to. How, Michael, do you measure the effectiveness of psychosocial impact assessment? Uh, well, in a, a situation where you're uh, doing uh, anticipatory work, um, uh, you measure it according to weight. And I'm talking here about how much weight the decision makers give the information that you uh, testify uh, to. If they ignore it completely, then <laughs> you haven't you haven't accomplished what you need to accomplish. Uh, if they pay attention to it, then you have. Uh, sometimes you do really, really good work and they don't pay any attention to it. Um, and that's happened to me more times than I would like. Uh, but it hasn't happened every time, or I would, I guess, be discouraged. Um, uh, but I think weight is really what you're looking for. There. You want to do superb work. Uh, the other thing I like is that because a lot of this work is public, uh, it, it's all public. Um, wh when I testify, for example, in Alberta, as I did in two cases there, uh, and the people who were uh, the interveners then stood up and, and testified that my testimony was right on the mark, 
I felt pretty good. Uh, when the judges then um, degraded my testimony and uh, actually took away my fees and uh, punished me, I didn't feel very good. Uh, but that was on them because I actually nailed it. Uh, and, you know, I, I, getting the work right is really the first uh, indicator. But having weight in the decision is what, what really is the calibration you need to hope for. Uh, with a uh, uh, looking backward case where you're trying to understand what the impacts of some disaster or event was, uh, for example, a toxic tort, you're uh, often looking to see whether or not uh, you can help the court understand what happened and how people were impacted. A lot of the work of the psychosocial impact assessor is to glue together the pieces so they become a coherent whole and the narrative exists which is useful for a judge and useful for a jury if one is there. And if you can explain that, uh, that's very helpful to the case. And then uh, hopefully you can, uh, if you had findings that were significant, those findings become recognized in the way that the case comes about, either with monetary compensation or with uh, various mitigations. Uh, let's say uh, the provision of medical monitoring and assistance if it's needed. Uh, so uh, one looks to see whether or not uh, the work that you have done actually is reflected in, again in the decision that's made. Do you need to set quantifiable thresholds to identify projects that cause irreversible psychological harm? I don't know that you can do that. Um, what the quantification would be, um, I think that uh, uh, the idea that there would be uh, some quantifiable, I'm not sure, well, for example, if you take noise exposure, there are quantifiable thresholds that exist for, uh, uh, for noise intensity, for example, and if you're producing more noise than that, you can assume that harm will occur. Uh, but even with noise, uh, in terms of psychosocial impact assessment, it doesn't quite capture what actually goes on, uh, because much of what happens with noise impact may be sub-threshold uh, in terms of intensity, uh, but it may be disruptive. You have disruptive noises that just um, bother you, uh, like the truck that went by before and captured my attention. Uh, those are eruptive noises. Uh, backup beepers are a great example. Uh, but anytime you have uh, noises that are disturbing, they can have major impacts. Children who can't uh, do their work, uh, their homework, um, people who can't concentrate on their work, etc. So um, that wouldn't show up in your threshold, in your quantifiable threshold. Uh, so I don't think there's a way of doing that. I think it's actually the wrong direction to go. I think you need to um, really use the standard of uh, asking whether there are potentially significant adverse impacts. Uh, if they can be quantified, fine. Uh, but a lot of them are not going to be. And if you just stick with the ones that they quantified, you're going to miss a lot of the action. Well, that wraps up our questions related to method. We're about halfway through our list of questions, so we'll move on to the section on case studies and examples. I'll start my second cup of coffee. <laughs> so, Michael, do you have an example where SIA has been used in the context of assessing historical or legacy issues associated with environmental impacts and community dislocation in developing countries? Um. I, uh, I did think of one example. Um, I, I would like actually to know more examples and I'm hoping to hear from people with them. Uh, but I did a, a study with uh, some colleagues of the impacts of the Aral Sea disaster in Uzbekistan. Uh, the drying up of the fourth largest inland body of water on earth over a 50 year period. Uh, we didn't have as much time on the ground to gather or psychosocial impact data as we would have liked. Um, but we were on the ground in the, in the affected communities and we were able to observe and then to look for uh, information to corroborate. And one of my colleagues, Astrid Cerny, uh, wrote an excellent chapter in our book on the Herald disaster uh, in which she gave an example. Um, you have uh, many different ethnic groups uh, in uh, the, the Silk Road region, which was uh, 
an original area of the world that had massive mixing of the world's populations. About as interesting a place on Earth as you'll find. And uh, in the Aral region, uh, likewise. And so, um, uh, one of the uh, ethnic groups that, that uh, lived there and uh, worked around the sea, but also in the, in the area uh, were uh, people of Kazakh uh, origin. And um, of course, just north of Uzbekistan and also sharing the Aral Sea was the country of Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan uh, put in place a, um, a policy of trying to encourage uh, Kazakh uh, um, uh, uh, nationals or Kazakh uh, ethnic uh, group uh, members to become Kazakh nationals, to move to Kazakhstan with good incentives. And so they were able to attract uh, from the Aral region uh, people who would otherwise have been destitute who were able to move to Kazakhstan and we didn't follow up on this but presumably uh, have a much better life uh, there than they would have if they stayed in the region. Uh, that left everybody else there and so you had a contrast between one group that actually had an exit strategy given them uh, and other people who've actually been left in a perpetual situation which uh, uh, doesn't seem to have a way out that's uh, there is no exit strategy and so people were uh, left there in a, in a pretty uh, unfortunate situation with a lot of adverse health and social impacts uh, but that's an example, I think, uh, that fits. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there are many in the world, and I, I just wanted to choose one from my own work that, uh, that I could give. Michael, how have communities in general responded to your work? Well, the word community uh, can be defined in different ways. But uh, where there's an impacted community, and I've done my work, they've responded uh, with uh, uh, enormous uh, uh, support privately and publicly uh, because um, what happens to people that are caught in disaster situations or turbulent situations, whether they're proposed projects or whether they're events that have already happened, is that the, um, the, the official process doesn't hear them about their psychosocial impacts. Uh, in my talk, I talked about the fact that psychosocial impacts are not often identified and studied and made part of official decision making and as a result people feel that they're not being heard and they often have to then become activists if they can to pursue their own uh, uh, victimization uh, and, and recompense uh, because nobody's taking care of them. And um, uh, so people are um, extremely supportive and they're extremely um, uh, I think excited that somebody has told their story in a way that it can be heard and in fact what psychosocial impact assessment is is an effort to tell people's stories so they can be heard in some kind of official way so that action can be taken. Uh, that's a way of defining it and uh, so when I achieve that and people are uh, happy with that uh, I'm, I'm happy that I've been able to, to, uh, 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 to do that for them. Uh, and um, uh, so they're very supportive. Now the word community, as I said, can be taken different ways. So the community of people who are victimized are supportive. The large community may not be so supportive because there may be vested interests in the larger community that are not served uh, by um, telling the victim's story uh, and by uh, seeking to have their interests uh, considered. So. Uh, uh, in that situation, it's possible to become the villain uh, in, uh, in other parts of the community. Uh, if what you're testifying to might shut down uh, uh, an industry that uh, is important to uh, some people, uh, they're not going to be very happy with your testimony. Um, if you're testifying uh, such that a permit might not be granted for a project that would have a lot of construction, uh, the people who want work from that construction are not going to be very happy. So there's a lot of controversy and lots of times I'm sitting in the middle of controversy with what I testify. And uh, if you don't want controversy, you shouldn't uh, do this work because it puts you right in the middle of it. Um, the reason why people are victimized is because uh, projects that serve some interests don't serve theirs. Um, they, they carry the burdens uh, for the benefit of others those who are benefiting 
uh, are not necessarily delighted by having that victimization laid out in detail. True, true. Do you formally follow up with information to specific communities? Uh, it depends on the situation. If you're working in a legal case, obviously your testimony is presented. Uh, everybody is familiar with it, uh, and they often are present uh, when you testify. That's true often uh, for work that's done for testimony in uh, regulatory hearings, permit hearings as well. Um, there are situations uh, where I've worked where we do data feedback very directly to the community, and uh, that can be uh, extremely effective. Um, so it really depends on the situation, but uh, the nature of the work um, that I do with psychosocial impact assessment is that it is public work. People see it. Uh, they have the ability at various levels uh, to call it out if they don't agree with it or if they think that you have misread a situation or if uh, your work is invalid. Uh, so uh, actually, particularly the legal work, but, but all this work is much more subjected to review, both uh, peer review, hostile peer review in many cases, um, uh, but uh, uh, also to public review uh, than any other social science work. It's the most out there work that social scientists can ever do. One participant from the webinar said that she's worked with tribes who have a specific sense of owning the data. Have you encountered this as well? I have. Uh, it's extremely interesting and in you know it's um, in a broader situation uh, the question of intellectual property. Uh, but when you collect people's stories and you you understand what's happened to them, uh, in any case you uh, uh, you have entered uh, a type of private sphere, and with Native people, that uh, uh, stepping into that sphere has very uh, important significance. Um, uh, in one situation, uh, before I was able to uh, start a study, which was actually uh, uh, condoned and sought after by the tribe, uh, but before I could start, I had a... a, a, a I guess I use the word shaman, but I had a, um, a person with religious powers uh, meet with me. Uh, they explained uh, that uh, what I would find uh, belonged to the tribe, uh, that uh, uh, they then uh, prayed at, for maybe a half hour or more, uh, that I would have the wisdom uh, to uh, only serve the interests of the tribe, to not uh, harm the tribe with what I learned. Uh, to not uh, use the information in a way that would be harmful or inappropriate. Uh, and they also asked that I share uh, anything that I would ever publish uh, for review before I, I ever published it, uh, and that they would have a, a, a say in that. And I've, I've tried to honor that. Um, I have honored that. So um, uh, I have encountered this. Um, I think that uh, uh, when you do this work, you have to understand that even when you're not in that situation, when you're dealing with people who are not uh, tribal people, who are people in, in any situation, you have to have a great deal of respect because you are learning a great deal about them. Um, and uh, what you publish or what you write about them, which, how you testify, uh, does disclose information about them. For that reason, when I, when I, well, when I testify, uh, I oftentimes have to identify my sources. My, I have to identify my sources, or it's derided as hearsay. So I let people know that that's going to happen. If they don't want to share something with me, they don't have to. If they don't want to answer a question, they don't have to. They don't have to talk to me at all. Uh, so it has to be completely voluntary. Uh, but if they do share with me, I, I, I am forced by the situation to not hold anything back in terms of their identity. Uh, however, when I publish information, uh, I, uh, unless people have explicitly asked me to identify them, I don't identify them. Uh, and uh, I try and protect uh, as much as I can people's identity uh, because uh, there's a great deal of disclosure that comes with this and one has to be very respectful of that disclosure. People are oftentimes so victimized by a situation that the only way they can 
address it is by disclosing how they've been impacted. It's the only tool that they have, and uh, one has to have a great deal of respect for that. Um, it's not the same as uh, dealing with Native peoples who uh, that intellectual property has extreme importance to, uh, but it's important in every situation. It has to be really paid attention to this kind of work. When turbulence occurs in some pattern of repetition, like floods, for example, that happen year after year or on a regular basis, do people's adaptations become normal for them? Well, I think in the case of floods, they may become normal in the sense that um, you don't keep your good stuff uh, in the basement uh, and you uh, uh, you are practiced in how to uh, uh, protect your life uh, and uh, and your animals, and uh, uh, so you you know what to expect and how to respond. Uh, that may be true. Uh, that doesn't mean there's no impact, and it doesn't mean that people who live in flooding areas don't lead lives that are significantly different than people who don't or don't expect to be flooded. And that difference is something you can study, and, and it's something that uh, can be looked at as an impact. Um, I find this uh, question, though, raises a, a generic issue. It's a really important issue. And I gave a case study during the webinar of gas extraction in southern Alberta. And I, I uh, showed a picture of a mountain range, Mount Bacchus. And I talked about the difference of impacts on the south side of Mount Bacchus and the north side. And the south side was a, let's use the term, a virgin area for impact. There hadn't been a lot of gas wells and gas pipelines there. Uh, and people who lived there moved there without any expectation this would occur. And they had a wilderness life, by and large, or a, a, a life in nature. And uh, it was very, very disruptable when gas extraction came at their door. Uh, well, that's one situation, uh, and there has been no adaptation effect, and the lack of that causes an impact. But on the north side of Mount Bacchus, uh, as I laid it out, uh, there were many gas wells and many gas pipelines, and there had been releases, and there were uh, many different companies involved, and people were engaged their entire lives, uh, a substantial amount of their time, in one way or another dealing with gas impacts. And uh, this came to rule people's lives. Now, uh, by extension, the question would posit that if you had additional gas wells north of Mount Bacchus, there would be no additional impact because people were so impacted that what's one more gas well, what's one more gas pipeline going to do when they already have so many? Uh, and there, uh, I had to reason this exact question out very carefully, and I've done it in other situations as well which is you often have with uh, uh, a turbulence uh, a situation of what I call perpetual jeopardy, which is, um, in this case, there's gas underneath the area. Uh, but beyond that, uh, because it's already so tainted, it's already been uh, disrupted, uh, it just invites more disruption. And the people there have already been impacted. It just invites them to be more and more and more impacted. And there's no there's a limit, seemingly, on how much impact they can be subjected to. But there are limits to how much impact they can cope with. And in the cases I looked at in this situation and in many others, people are pushed way past their adaptive capability. They may be living with it, but they're way past their adaptive capability. And all kinds of uh, adverse consequences have happened, happened to them. Uh, and they may be stuck in the situation and unable to leave because of their property value and their uh, ability to afford to leave. Uh, so they're just hanging in there, uh, but they're not doing well because their lives are disrupted in every way. Adding more uh, insult to them, this is really disproportionate impact uh, up the wazoo. And whether they were started out as a vulnerable population or not, they're now a highly vulnerable population to more impact. So you have different scenarios in uh, south and north of Mount Bacchus that speak to this, uh, but there's no argument that can be made that people have learned how to uh, adapt to these impacts and they can just take more and more and more. That's actually not what, what happens. Uh, 
they're experts on living with gas wells, but that expertise comes at a great cost, and uh, that needs to be understood. And I think it's also true for for flooding as well. We'll move on to our next section of questions, which relate to applications and interventions. Uh, this first one is a little longer. Can you speak to some of the ways you can communicate the necessity of psychosocial impact assessment to regulatory agencies so that they recognize the positive sides of integrating community wisdom to their decisions, despite the risk of this assessment potentially pointing towards halting a project? Well, that's, uh, you know, uh, the million dollar question, or I guess at this point, the billion dollar question. Um, uh, you know, uh, calling it community wisdom, I think, is correct, uh, but I would prefer to talk about it as, a, uh, uh, you know, a reliable and valid uh, scientific information about community impact. Um, and um, um, how does one convince a regulatory agency to address this? Uh, well, I've had some abject failures as in Alberta. Um, you, you don't so much have a chance to convince a regulatory agency. You are invited, uh, perhaps, to give testimony. You prepare that testimony. Uh, you may not know what triggers you're going to push by the way you state it, and uh, I tend to be pretty in your face, and that didn't work well in Alberta. Um, I don't mince words very well, um, nor do I think they should always be minced or uh, qualified or played down. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, as a, a psychosocial impact assessor, one doesn't necessarily have the relationship with the uh, decision maker to convince them. Um, the only thing one can do is present evidence that is strong. Uh, that is well-researched, uh, that is capable of getting peer support. Uh, sometimes you get the peer support up front um, in the form of, you know, letters of support. Um, and uh, you do the best that you can do to uh, present it in a, uh, uh, a very uh, expert, uh, professional way. And um, uh, after that, you don't have much control. Now, there are times that regulators realize they need help, uh, and uh, those are uh, not as often as I would like, uh, but I did spend some time, for example, working with the uh, Centers for Disease Control in the United States, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease, Disease Registry, which is part of the CDC. Uh, they, they carried out a long project that involved myself and, and other experts trying to help their uh, environmental health people come to understand the overall psychosocial context within which they were uh, dealing with communities so that they could be more effective. That was great. Unfortunately, the project never was finished. Uh, we wrote a manual there, but it was never published. Uh, and that's frustrating because, you know, the administrator in charge of that division changed or something, and they didn't follow up on the project. Uh, but they tried for a while to work on this. They realized that it was important. Um, and they actually have some psychosocial people on staff, not many, but, but they're great. Um, and uh, the New York State Department of Health and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation at one point asked me to do workshops for them, which I did. And I would love it if more of that happened. Uh, but uh, agencies are interested in doing good work. Um, and the decision makers are often interested in making good decisions. Uh, they're limited often by their own training and by the way the decision making process is structured. And as the question implies, by, uh, by the fact that they have a, uh, a vested interest in certain types of decisions being, being made, uh, citing the facilities that their agency has set up to cite. Uh, but um, uh, oftentimes one doesn't have entry to try and convince them and um, I think that the, the courts play an important role here. If you present testimony and it's valid testimony, uh, that gives a basis then for administrative challenges to decisions that are made. 
and uh, uh, sometimes the judges are responsive and they'll override a decision or force it to be made again. Uh, and sometimes you have uh, groups of judges that actually just become curious themselves, as happened with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the, uh, uh, their uh, administrative judges who were looking at Indian Point and realized that the way that environmental justice was being looked at by their own agency didn't make any sense. It wasn't defensible. And they were then looking for guidance. They wanted uh, guidance. Uh, so uh, you got to keep trying every avenue, uh, and the more you do, the, the greater chance you have of uh, uh, getting people to start paying attention. And if they start paying attention, uh, you may be able to even be in the position of helping them uh, understand that there's this whole area of impact they've ignored. Uh, the one last element that I've mentioned before that should be noted here is that uh, concerned publics tend to challenge decisions. Uh, they try and intervene. They, they testify. They stand there and talk about how they think they're going to be impacted and how their basis for their concerns. Oftentimes, what they testify to is right on. Uh, and you know, the the people who have to make these decisions listen to this, and they may rule it out. They may not want to hear it, but at some point they hear it. And if they want to find a way to actually bring this consideration into their thinking, then they need psychosocial impact assessment testimony to sort out what's real and what's not real, what they should pay attention to and what they don't need to pay attention to. And uh, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, uh, the people who go and um, are heard and want to be heard uh, create a basis for wanting to have testimony that makes evidentiary uh, the, the issues that are important uh, for the decision makers to hear. Michael, how would you advise that companies deal with the high demands they place on their communities in engagement? That's an important issue, and, and actually the case study I gave uh, really raises that question where the people who were in the area where uh, Shell was placing the gas well uh, had many, many gas wells, and they weren't often the same company, but even with Shell, they had meetings with them about every single pipeline and gas well and metering station and pumping station, and it just generated an extraordinary amount of contact. But what I learned in that situation from the people was that oftentimes uh, on the real questions, they weren't involved, they weren't being considered, and when an accident happens, uh, things didn't work out uh, the way they were supposed to, and the company didn't uh, own the problem and didn't address it. And so there was an enormous amount of contact that was trivial contact. It was um, people were insulted by it. Uh, people, uh, the, the agents uh, that were like essentially PR people for the companies would deluge these people with contact. But it wasn't substantive. And the reality is, is that people who live near hazards want to know that they're safe. They want to know that they're going to be protected. They want to know if something does happen to them that they'll be taken care of. Uh, they want their families to be safe, et cetera, et cetera. That's the bottom line. And um, that bottom line is often not part of what gets discussed. People get invited to picnics. People get invited occasionally for tours of the plant, look how beautiful it is. Uh, but this is not substantive contact. I mentioned during the webinar a process that um, I started doing through my nonprofit organization that looked like it was very fruitful. And in, in the instances that we did this, it, it was good. Um, and that's where we, we were able to get regulatory agencies to build into permits a requirement uh, for what we called a party of interest process, where the interested parties, the people who had come to the hearing and intervened or, or raised concerns, were able to have ongoing meetings with uh, the representatives of, the, in this case, industrial plant, and in another case, of landfill, um, and uh, to raise concerns on an ongoing basis that had to be addressed. The regulatory agency also came to those meetings and had input, and uh, you set guidelines for recourse if uh, the company wasn't responsive or the landfill wasn't responsive to the government agency. Uh, 
And um, uh, that meant that people participated, but they participated in a real process that had repercussions for uh, the, uh, the permit holder, uh, which might even lead to the permit being removed if the permit holder couldn't manage the impacts on the people. Frankly, that's what that's the kind of um, public participation or ongoing participation or ongoing relationship between a company and the people it deals with that uh, carries weight. Uh, you have to not waste people's time and you have to protect them. Those are the bottom lines. Are there studies, Michael, that value the change before and after interventions to reduce psychosocial impact on affected populations? Um, there are some studies. I wouldn't say there are a lot. Um, in the case of my own work, I don't usually have a chance to go back and do post work, although I would love to. Um, but it, the occasion doesn't necessarily arise. I've applied for grants occasionally to do it, but uh, they weren't funded. But um, I think um, one intervention that did get studied, it was a brilliant uh, a brilliant study of the impacts, a psychosocial study. It was a brilliant intervention done by the researchers using the data they had gotten, and it was a brilliant subsequent follow-up. Uh, this was done uh, in the case of the Exxon Valdez accident, uh, and uh, was done by um, Steve Pico and Dwayne Gill and uh, people who worked with them. Uh, Maury Cohen was involved at one point. And they, they did their work primarily in the community of Cordova, they looked at the impacts on Cordova from the Exxon Valdez accident, uh, so they did an impact study. Uh, they then brought their data back to community meetings and helped the community develop ways of coping with the situation. Uh, and it's one of the finest uh, pieces of work I know of uh, from people that I have uh, admired and uh, uh, considered to be close colleagues for a long time. Uh, it's one example that I can cite. How can psychosocial impact assessment on urban developments on a smaller scale improve SIA without funding? Um, well, I mean, there isn't always money to hire experts, but the kind of work that we're talking about is really how you systematically study uh, the impact, of either anticipatory or reactive on a community from some environmental change. And that can be done by uh, community organizations that organ organize themselves to do it. Uh, it, is, it is done by community organizations. Uh, it's not a mystical process. Uh, the main reason to bring experts in is if you need to try and bring weight into an administrative process or a legal process which looks to experts to uh, uh, screen whether or not impacts are real and how much weight should be given them. But the impacts themselves can be studied by the community. Uh, and uh, this can be done uh, as a, a naive process, as a community scale process, a participatory process. And uh, I think that it's important to do it. Uh, lots of times small scale projects can have significant impacts. Uh, scale, um, well, what we're talking about is small scale may not actually be that small. Uh, but it may be local. Um, so uh, um, bringing to bear those uh, assessments and, and making that information available, as we said earlier, uh, because of a good question, at the design level um, and implementation level as well as at the approval level, uh, can help make projects better. Uh, so I would encourage, and if we get around to doing these guidelines we're talking about, we can try and uh, develop them so that they're community accessible as well. Um, this, this is something that should be done. And I would encourage people to do it. Could you tell us how the indigenous communities you have worked with were able to mobilize to have PSIA conducted for their issues? And what were those issues? <clears throat> well, in, uh, uh, I, I haven't worked with uh, thousands of uh, indigenous communities, although I love uh, doing it, so I would love to work with more. Uh, but I've worked with a number of them, and uh, generally this has occurred because the attorneys who represent them 
uh, have uh, uh, invited me in. And uh, in working particularly with one attorney, uh, Tom Lubin, uh, I developed a strategy. Uh, this grew out of uh, a, 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 a small study I did a long time ago in Hawaii with Native Hawaiians who opposed geothermal energy. Uh, Tom was able, in working with uh, the, uh, the Native community there who be, became plaintiffs uh, in a lawsuit uh, challenging a decision, uh, they were they almost got to the U.S. Supreme Court on an argument that the religious rights of the Native Hawaiians was being defiled by the project. And um, they, they certainly got to the state Supreme Court. Uh, and when they tried to go to the U.S. Supreme Court, they were blocked by a, a lawsuit uh, called um, Ling. Um, and um, the, the nexus of the Ling case uh, was a Supreme Court decision that basically ruled out making religious arguments uh, uh, as a basis for trying to stop projects. Certainly limited the ability to do that. And that led Tom and I to uh, take this small study that I did and ask the question of what would happen if we made a psychosocial argument um, for the impacts that were occurring to a Native community uh, that was not just based on a, 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 a a right to religion uh, argument that was based on uh, on the impacts themselves and the weight they should carry. Uh, and so we uh, spent many years looking for a case uh, that we could uh, uh, bring that argument. Uh, and uh, so a, a number of the studies I did were trying to develop a, a basis for that. Uh, none of those came to fruition. Uh, but uh, but they were good attempts, and uh, just it didn't work out uh, to go in that direction. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm hopeful uh, that I'll be doing a study in Hawaii again on the same question: uh, the impact on Native Hawaiians of geothermal energy development. And uh, that case allows me to answer the question in a different way, which is in that case, in this instance, this current instance. Um, Native Hawaiians have decided they want a psychosocial study to be done. Uh, they want it to be a parallel to a health study that was approved, and the psychosocial study has been approved. Uh, it hasn't been contracted, and we have to see if that uh, proceeds. Uh, but, uh, but this has been uh, actively uh, pushed by the Native Hawaiian community. Uh, they have uh, come to hearings and uh, or come to meetings and uh, called for this. They have brought, uh, they, they asked me to develop a proposal for a study that they actively took uh, to decision makers uh, and got it approved. And um, the, the money uh, has to be uh, allocated from uh, the Geothermal Impact Fund uh, for it to actually happen. And we'll, we're hopeful that that will now proceed. Uh, but here you have a Native community that's been very proactive in wanting psychosocial impact assessment, and it may be a model uh, for what can happen in other situations. Uh, what sets PSIA in contexts like a terrorist attack apart from other contexts such as climate change, waste, nuclear disasters, and other types of things? Well, let me answer this uh, in two ways. One is that um, 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 in an abstract sense, which is that terrorist attacks raise very particular issues about trust and protection um, and fear uh, that are uh, different than other events. And as an event, they are tend to be very acute events, but they always carry out the threat of possible additional events. And so they're very disruptive of our sense of uh, what would I call anticipatory fear uh, and the, the possibilities of situations which we are exposed to but not able to be protective of. In the instance that I worked with uh, a terrorist event, it was a World Trade Center disaster. And much of the attention uh, after the World Trade Center disaster rightly went to uh, the people who were actually in the buildings, um, and particularly to the emergency responders, uh, who were extraordinarily brave in every way, and uh, 
who were impacted very, very strongly, both acutely and chronically. Um, I worked with a different group, which was the residents of Lower Manhattan uh, who lived in the area generally around the World Trade Center disaster and who were exposed to environmental hazards from the disaster uh, because of air pollution that uh, entered buildings um, and coated buildings uh, and uh, uh, represented a long-term uh, continuing uh, impact for people who moved back into the communities. Uh, there were psychosocial impacts beyond that hazard uh, as well that had to do with living in a, a basically destroyed community uh, as well uh, as around a destroyed building. And as that community has been rebuilt, uh, correlates to uh, the site being restored and changed. Uh, but this is uh, an area that uh, will always be connected to uh, a very sad chapter in the history of the world and, and to palpable losses that occurred right before people's eyes uh, and to environmental hazards that were persistent and may still be to some degree in existence uh, and to the loss of uh, community uh, attributes, uh, markets, stores, uh, transportation that basically isolated an area of New York City uh, in, in a very direct way. Uh, there were many different facets to the psychosocial impacts um, and uh, uh, the community ended up being relatively speaking ignored in its impacts because so much attention was given uh, to, uh, to the emergency responders and to the, of course, the people who were working in the buildings. Um, and this is a very major area of impact. And uh, so I've written about this. It's in uh, the book I did called uh, Cultures of Contamination is where I published it. Uh, and I had uh, the help of amazing uh, uh, people from the community and in particular uh, a, a co-author who is extremely connected and remains extremely connected in that community. Uh, one of our uh, webinar participants asked how to better stress the cumulative impacts of modern agriculture approaches and a consumerism-oriented development model on disappearance of some climate-resilient farm management strategies in third-world rural communities like Haiti. Well, I think this is a great question. And um, outside of impact assessment, um, uh, various um, Social scientists have done uh, some work in uh, of this nature. Uh, my former uh, late colleague, Hank Front, for example, did work on uh, um, the growing of bananas in Latin America. Uh, so I think you'll find that there are models in social science that are applicable. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I think this is a great area to approach from the standpoint of cumulative impact assessment. <clears throat> we clearly have uh, a turbulence that's occurred. There's been a, a major shift over time of the way agriculture is done. Uh, it's led to uh, major dislocations. Uh, it's led to a major change in the way that uh, farmers live their lives uh, and how people are involved in food growing. Uh, and oftentimes it's led to their victimization uh, in many ways, but among others from the exposure to pesticides and uh, you know, all the chemicals that are used to contaminate water, contaminated air, contaminated food. Uh, so it's had a major environmental health impact as well. Um, and um, it's changed the economics. It's had really thorough um, uh, impacts all through the lifescape and lifestyle and emotional lives of, of people. So I think it's, um, it's ripe for study. Uh, I don't know exactly what the context for study might be, but it would make a great um, USAID or World uh, 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 Trade Organization uh, study uh, and uh, or UN study uh, or just academic study uh, done um, outside of a regulatory context. Uh, but I'm quite sure there are, are significant impacts that have occurred. 
I'm quite sure that they can be documented, documented very thoroughly. I'm quite sure that they can be studied in their cumulative sense because there's so many different impacts and of course they all interact with each other. And I'm quite sure that that study could have uh, some uh, implications in terms of looking at alternatives such as sustainable agriculture and a whole different way of uh, trying to return uh, farming to, to the land where it actually occurs in terms of that culture and there are implications for every place on earth in terms of uh, breaking down that uh, modern agriculture that has made uh, food unsustainable and created a, a food security issue in the world that is very significant. What experience, Michael, have you had in resettlement planning, implementation, and pre-audit? And what lessons have you learned? I haven't um, had a lot of experience in uh, resettlement in a lot of situations. Um, in fact, much of my research has been with people who would like to uh, resettle but are unable to. They're stuck in the situation. Uh, those are the, the toxic contamination, the contaminated communities, uh, where sometimes people have resettled, uh, but most often they have been stuck. Um, but I have looked at resettlement issues uh, a number of times. Uh, I mentioned Love Canal uh, and uh, some of this, the cases where people have moved. Uh, but I haven't, uh, I've, I've been involved in proposing as an expert that resettlement occur. Uh, but I haven't so much been involved in actually carrying it out or seeing it carried out. Uh, just one example, I've been working for uh, many years with um, the Turtle Clan of the Ramapo uh, Lenape indigenous people of uh, New Jersey, uh, the Turtle Clan in particular, but, but the Ramapo as a whole, were heavily impacted by uh, a widespread uh, practice of environmental uh, illegal, or at that time maybe legal, disposal of hazardous waste carried out by the Ford Motor Company. And Ford has never really owned up to the extent to which it contaminated a, a wide region, that region heavily inhabited by the Ramapos. And as indigenous people, it's the land is sacred to them. They're not easily uh, brought to leave it. Uh, but the costs of staying have been extraordinary. And I recommended uh, following up on the, uh, uh, the, the advice of the chief of the Turtle Clan, who himself believes that relocation is necessary. Uh, I developed testimony for the EPA and as part of what in the United States is called the Superfund process uh, that would lead to uh, considering uh, the relocation of uh, the people who live in uh, one particular community in Upper Ringwood, and I believe that uh, that relocation is justified. Whether they would leave or not, they should have the, the right to relocate and the ability to create a community to relocate to that would uh, be still in their native lands and still um, uh, meet their social and cultural needs, uh, but not uh, uh, expose them to hazards the way they're exposed now. Uh, but anyway, I, I haven't had extensive experience. I've become interested in relocation. I've been talking to uh, IAIA people who work on relocation and intend to do some work with them. Uh, I think it's an extremely important topic always. It's become maybe the topic, and I, I believe that psychosocial impact assessment has a major role to play because so often when people are relocated, there is no control over where they're relocated to. The environments that are relocated in are temporary environments often, but they may become, as has happened in parts of the world, permanent relocation points. Uh, their people's needs uh, may not be met in so many different ways, uh, collectively, individually, at the family level. Um, there are all kinds of damages that uh, occur because of the process of relocation. Uh, and I believe that all of that needs to be studied and understood, and we need to change the way we do relocation, even as environmental relocation and relocation from war uh, becomes a greater and greater phenomenon in volume. Uh, 
and our ability to deal with it seems to be poorer and poorer and poorer. Uh, that's just uh, something that cannot continue and psychosocial impact assessment has a major role to play in understanding what we've been doing wrong, what we continue to do wrong, and what we need to put in place in order to be prepared for uh, the fact that there's obviously going to be more people who need relocation and uh, how do we address this issue. We, we need to know how to do it, we need to be ready to do it, and we need to do it well. How can we improve the response of proponents toward project action plans when there are emerging project triggered issues? Well, if I understand the question correctly, uh, and I don't, I'm not used to using the term project action plan, but I did do some research on it when I saw it, P-A-P in the question. Um, I think we're really talking about uh, plans that are done for projects. Uh, and uh, uh, when you talk about emerging issues, uh, how do you get people to respond better to them? Well, you know, uh, uh, the, from a PR perspective, we try and package projects so that they look attractive and so that the benefits look like they outweigh the costs. And in fact, in public relations work uh, and sometimes in design work, we focus only on the benefits or on the beauty of the project and how good it looks and how great living in this new environment is going to be or whatever. Uh, and we ignore uh, those emerging issues. The fact, of, uh, the, the fact is that the emerging issues are what need to be studied in psychosocial impact assessment, and they need to be understood and recognized and dealt with in the action plans. If they're not dealt with, then there's a problem there. And what I find is that the more glossy the project, uh, oftentimes the less, least willing the proponents are to own up to what the impacts are likely to be, and the more they're trying to hide them behind the gloss. Uh, the affected community is not going to necessarily be fooled, although some will. And, um, uh, but if we're really serious about psychosocial impact assessment, if we're really serious about impact assessment at all, uh, we need to really be looking at what the consequences are of the project as proposed, as set forth in the action plan, and we need to be mitigating them. If it's an action plan, part of that action needs to be recognizing those emergent issues and addressing them and mitigating them. Now, the word emergent is interesting here because uh, as you move forward with a project, issues do emerge that weren't anticipated at an earlier point in time of design, and they become necessary to do redesign to go back and uh, to uh, figure out how to address them. That's what mitigation is. And uh, so uh, you don't create greater acceptance with uh, action plans, project action plans, without addressing the emerging issues. That's how you get acceptance is by owning them and sometimes you can't address them. And there are adverse impacts that occur, and sometimes you can't mitigate those adverse impacts. And maybe that means the decision makers should say no. Uh, if they say yes, then uh, the people who are impacted need to be dealt with uh, in some way. And if you know what the consequences are, then you can figure out how to deal with them. Or they can seek legal recourse. What management and mitigation measures can proponents use to address psychosocial effects? Well, uh, proponents um, need to uh, understand what the psychosocial impacts of their projects are. Historically, my experience with proponents is that that's the last thing that they, they want to understand or have be known. And I can't tell you how many times I've come up against credible experts who were hired to argue that there are no psychosocial impacts. It's actually, I'm embarrassed for my colleagues. They may get a lot more money than I do for saying there are no impacts, but their impacts are there. Uh, and uh, saying they aren't there doesn't make them go away. Even sometimes when the decision makers get fooled, or they get an out because they now can say, 
well, this expert said there was no problem. Um, the ways that um, impacts are often tried to be deal, dealt with are uh, by ignoring them, but coming up with other steps like community benefits. We'll give you, I, I think I mentioned this in my webinar talk, but uh, you know, we'll give you a new fire truck or a new community center, which is great. Um, but um, or we'll give you some jobs, which is also important, uh, not to be uh, knocked down as, as a, an importance. Uh, but uh, but you know you're you're not really addressing the impacts head on. Uh, in my view and in my practice, you need to lay the impacts out and figure out how you're going to address them. And if you're the proponent and you want to be honest with the community and have a good on term ongoing relationship with the community uh, that you are serving or impacting, uh, you need to know what those impacts are and you need to either make them go away in the way you do your project, you need to have emergency response plans that are honestly protective and don't have lots of fluff in them uh, or false promises. Uh, you need to um, uh, have ongoing monitoring so emergent issues are Address, uh, are known and can be addressed. You need to have enough respect for the community uh, that you have ongoing real participation from the community and with the community, which means real conversations with the ability for emergent issues to really be brought forward, to be really addressed. And you need to have, I think, a permit that uh, holds your foot to the fire or enough integrity to hold your own feet to the fire. I don't see it very often, uh, but, but this is what needs to happen. If you're a real a proponent that really has a sense of uh, authenticity and really is concerned about the communities that you're going to impact, that's what you need to do. Psychosocial impact assessment is the tool that allows you to identify the issues to begin with and used in a monitoring ongoing sense allows you to stay on top of it. All right, impact assessment, Michael, presumes the rule of law. Yet many people live under extreme social turbulence such as organized crime, gangs, violence, delinquency, drug trafficking, protests, revolt, ter terrorism, paralyzing corruption. So absent state control, their absent state control and the ability to assure that human needs are met. So does psychosocial impact assessment have a role in these situations? Well, I wish I could say that those situations don't occur, but it seems like they're of uh, growing occurrence, uh, not lessening. And uh, of course, that's a major threat to sustainability worldwide. Uh, and because they're a reality, um, psychosocial impact assessment is important in these situations, even if there's no decision maker with the authority or power to carry out the authority. They're important because the more we can document how people are actually impacted, uh, the more we can try and bring that information uh, to others who might be able to be of assistance, uh, the more it becomes documentation for social change, uh, the more uh, it becomes uh, a basis for uh, international legal tribunals where the rule of law may occur outside of the situation. Uh, that we're uh, uh, that you're confronted with, uh, the more it becomes a basis for people to at least keep track of what's happened to them and how their situation has changed, how they've been potentially debased and forced to undergo adverse impacts on a major major scale. Uh, you know, in one of the worst situations of this that ever occurred, the Holocaust. The people who coped the best in the Holocaust, as uh, uh, some of the great uh, psychologists who emerged from that horror proved, were the people who were able to keep track of what the impacts were, who were able to document them and try and understand them. And I think that that's true in these situations as well. Uh, so whether social scientists carry out the research, whether it's carried out from inside the situation, obviously unofficially, 
whether it's done in the in, under the context of journalism, which does do psychosocial impact assessment of the sort, and sometimes really well. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, know and keep track of what has happened uh, because the people who have been victimized deserve that because if any change is going to occur, if any recompense is going to occur, if justice is ever going to uh, be reached, um, the more you know about what's happened, uh, the more evidence there is uh, to serve as a basis for trying to sort the situation out at a later point in time. Uh, so it's tragic that this is occurring. It's tragic that it's a growing occurrence. It's tragic that absent the rule of law, there isn't easy recourse. Uh, but just to use an example, in many situations where turbulence is occurring on a, on a, a massive scale, international corporations are involved still in extracting resources. Um, those international corporations should be held to task for the impacts that they are bringing about or helping to bring about. Um, and if evidence exists, there's a basis for doing that. Uh, so I think PSIA has a role to play here. It may be a very different role, uh, but it needs to be carried out. Okay, Michael, we have one last question, and it's a pretty broad and overarching question, but a good one to add or to end with, and you may have covered it in various aspects already, but what would you say are the main benefits and challenges with the implementation of psychosocial impact assessments? Well, I think they have been touched on, but having weight, being able to gain weight with the evidence that you accrue, with the testimony you prepare, is the end goal. You want not just to document how people have been or will be victimized, you want to uh, create a way out for the, the people who are, have been victimized a way of gaining justice, a way of gaining compensation, a way of gaining assistance as they need it. Uh, and for people who may be victimized where there's potentially significant impacts from proposed projects, you want to gain weight in the decision that's made. Uh, you want to gain the possibility of a project being denied because of the impacts that would occur, but you certainly also want to gain mitigation if the project goes forward. And um, uh, so there's a, uh, many barriers to doing this. I can't say this is a wide open rosy field. It's a field that really, I think, needs to assert itself. I've spent 40 years in some way trying to do this with, I think, a great deal of success, uh, but also some, some failure. And um, uh, what I uh, encountered when I gave a paper at IAIA a number of years ago in Calgary was uh, some friends, including Charlie Wolf, the founder of Social Impact Assessment, and uh, a dear friend who uh, was also the founder of IAIA, as I know, because I was there with him when he did it. Uh, Charlie and uh, some other good friends came up to me and said, uh, Mike, you, you now need to face the fact that you've been doing this all this time and you need to try and make PSIA into a much broader field and help to train and, and inform others to do it. Uh, the reality is, is if this is done at a much larger scale, it'll gain much greater acceptance. And um, uh, I have uh, plotted along doing this, uh, looking for every opportunity, sometimes compensated, sometimes not, uh, working with as many different groups as I can uh, sometimes not getting to others who I would love to work with, but I haven't been able to get stretch that far. Uh, so there's many projects I haven't done. Um, I've worked with as many graduate students as I can, and I see them beginning to do work. I've encouraged everyone that I can to uh, work in this field. And I'm now encouraging all of you who listen to this uh, to get out there and do this in whatever form you can. Uh, because I think that it's only when we bring evidence, and I mean real evidence, uh, valid evidence to bear, uh, that we create a force for paying attention to that evidence. And um, that's what it's about. And uh, 
So, uh, Charlie, you're no longer here with us, uh, but we hear you in many different ways in this field. Uh, but as a, a friend and colleague, I'm heeding your advice and I'm calling on uh, my colleagues who have the wherewithal to do psychosocial impact assessment uh, to collect as much evidence as we can, to share that evidence, to publish it so that it's both um, literature in the field that we can draw on for corroboration, for looking at convergence of findings, for finding where there's divergent findings that we need to look at more, to build theory, because I'm very much, as I've uh, already spoken to, into building theory, to build theory that helps guide us, uh, to uh, uh, really trying to, to use this uh, field for social change, because uh, really this is about um, not victimizing people, uh, or if they are victimized, gaining them justice, and there's a great deal of social change there, and to feeding largely into the field of uh, emerging sustainability and social change that goes with sustainability, um, where as the Europeans have started thinking about precaution, uh, we think about uh, taking actions uh, that don't have the kind of significant, adverse, destructive consequences that many of the actions we take do. And um, those can be small actions, they can be confined actions, they can be broad actions such as the question about agriculture. Uh, they can have, they always have cumulative effects which we always need to pay attention to. Uh, but it's in our power to actually make this field really into a field at this point, to really build a literature, to build um, a, a wave of evidence uh, that can't be easily pushed aside as uh, people have tried to push aside the evidence in the past, and to really get uh, accepted the idea that you have to pay attention to these issues, and uh, uh, both legally in the regulatory sphere, in the corporate sphere, in the ethical sphere, in every sphere uh, possible. Uh, so uh, I think that's an important question. Overcoming the barriers at this point, I think, has to do with growing the field. So let's grow. Great. Well, thanks again, Michael, for sharing your time to address all of these questions. There were so many. And thanks to all the participants of the original live webinar who submitted so many great questions. We really hope that providing these answers in this way with this recording um, and making it available to everybody will benefit more people than just replying individually to the person who asked the question. So we wanted to give this a broader reach, and we hope that you appreciate and enjoy it. We know your time is valuable, and we hope this question and answer session was valuable to you as well. See you next time.